work was so amazing. So this is watercolour, but he literally scraped through with um, undisclosed instruments. He didn't really give, give away everything that he did. He did does mention credit cards at one point, though. But um, there's nobody anywhere who says you can't take tube watercolour and use it like oil if you want, if that's something that you enjoy. So what that's actually what he's doing here is... Um, Loading on paint and, and scraping through it. You can see the colour of the colours are great as well. Oh, just beautiful. Oh, yes, yeah, so I love that. Don't particularly like one on the front because I don't like Viridian Green. But. <laughs> okay, so we just kept it really general up to the break and then afterwards we'll get in a bit more detail. And uh, the crucial review stage, which will alter everything potentially. So that's it. I'm going to change my water. <laughs>
and it's advancing it in towards the front, see? And it's breaking up that horizon, which is very solid. You don't actually have to have a really solid horizon. I'm going to do it here as well. The green will come off really easily, the purple will need a little bit of coaxing. You can always use, if you thoroughly want to remove the, the paint, I use a kitchen roll, but at the, quite often I just let the, the remaining paint that we just rubbed away just run away, and it's sort of, um, quite useful actually. So there's an area here that I'm just going to lift off. It's just your own judgement, if, if you can break up this horizon, it, it adds extra complexity to your design. With this area of green, the people are closer, you're going to see it comes off much more easily. Not so staining. You can really start to actually, if you want, develop um, shadows at, by lifting out. So um, there's light sources behind. You would probably expect shadows if you have, um, if the ground isn't very high. So I'm starting to get down. Yeah, the purple is just not going to come away as much. So that's a bit of um, lifting off. Um, I'll, um, I'll come back to the trees again because one other aspect of lifting off is being able to knock back whole features. So at the moment, I just applied the brush and made all of these um, pieces of wood. And effectively, they're all pretty similar. So what I could do is actually lift off to make one of them maybe a little bit more knocked back by the light. So I'm going to lift this central one off. And it's going to look like the light is sort of eclipsing it, going around it. So whilst it's there, it's now been obscured by the strength of sunlight. So that's quite useful. I'll do this lifting off with portraits a lot. Um, as you can imagine, you know, the, the subtlety you can get, just making sure that the edges of areas are really smoothed over so the skin. Um, that's a really useful technique. The whole of the mouth is um, not painted on, it's lifted off um, because of the softness of lifting off and um, mouths are such soft things to paint. So I painted the alisa and crimson and mixed other sort of colours that typically raw sienna and then lifted off some of the sort of clip first sort of dry areas. I'll just bring that to the pigeons outside. <laughs> So, um, trees. So we talked about putting detail in later on. And, um, this rigger is great for lifting up to the tops of the boughs of trees. The pressure re reduces as you lift up and then it makes the mark taper to nothing. And whilst you can't really see, you know, the trees are probably a bit short. I'm going to do that now. So what I'm doing is literally um, just grabbing the rigger, putting it in. I'm not going to wet the area first because I'm starting to make clear detail and um, I don't want it to disperse. So I'm lifting up to the end so that um, if, you, if you imagine, if you go from the top down, you're going to have some very solid um, sort of truncated uh, features on your, on your tree. <laughs> so, so unfortunately this is drawing and um, there's no two ways about it. And trees, you observe them and they've got some real important sort of angles where the branches go off. You just really have to look, they're quite often like elbows, they've got a sort of um, an area of wood that goes within that angle and curves it rather than just. It's hard to actually de describe what I'm on about. Do you know what I mean? That there tends to be almost like car cartilage in where, the, where two um, branches might meet. 
what I'm doing now, just going back in, and you can still use these as almost like drain pipes for painting, so that the paint will rush down these wet branches. I'll demonstrate that. Um, let's just, I'll just wet this area again at the bottom and show you. Just add in a turquoise, you'll see it travel. So I'm in, introducing it at the top of the tree. Maybe you won't be able to see because it's too small, but it is, it's running right down the tree. It should come out the other side, it's just starting to come out at the bottom of the bottom. And that sort of spreads almost roots. It's quite handy. So you've just got to decide how your trees are going to be for yourself. Um, and I take a bit of care about making sure that they have slightly different features, you know. Um, one might have no branches lower down, the other one might split quite low down, you know, just choosing your tree types. And this is um, something that I'd spend a little bit of time trying to build up because with the idea of a sort of a tree tunnel effect. And um, at this point I'd also, um, I really like it when ivy is wrapped around the base of a tree, that's quite interesting in a painting. So I would put in at this point ivy cladding if there's ivy you want to add or Alternatively, I mean, any reeds, grasses, you know, um, details like that, and you're creating a sort of a silhouette of those against, hopefully, a, a wash behind. And again, you're sort of um, playing with the tone and if you want to, you can still, with a damp brush, reduce the tone in some places if you think it's too heavy. And just lift them off. And actually, with trees, you tend to see the whole branch and trunk. So it's good to actually disrupt them. So it looks like the foliage is coming in front of the, the branches. So all I'm doing is going with that, the lifting off brush and removing some of the twigs. And now it looks like the tree is literally going in and out of its own foliage. Do you see what I mean? Even without having painted any foliage in. Does everyone understand what I mean there? It's quite, quite useful. At this stage, um, See, I, would, I was just saying before, I don't do paint this quickly. I don't paint in a couple of hours. I'll always take at least a couple of days, usually more. Something simple like this, it, I might be able to do it in two to three days. It's that break of time to think and observe that's really useful as well. But um, as you go along, you'll see certain things need to change. Like I really want to join those features up. So I've just added in some green there to create a more interesting shape. It's that constant sort of pushing and pulling that you're, you're into now. Um, now you've painted quite a bit. Just beware being too heavy handed with your trees because remember we're talking about the light lifting up at the top and so slightly obscuring some of these features is appropriate. It should be um, the, the light should actually push, um, just, just completely obscure the branches, a bit like in this picture where there's sun behind the branches, you just can't see the branches against the sun. And the same sort of thing uh, as you go up the tree, maybe the branches could be a little bit um, obscured by the light that's coming from behind. 
And if you want to, you could add a little bit of foliage. What I tend to do for foliage with this rough board is turn, again, turn the brush, the rigger in this case, on its side and rub the paint on because the, this wonderful rough surface is going to do a good job of breaking up the paint into slightly natural um, features. So um, we've put in a bit more of the uh, tree area, um, done a little bit of lifting off. I would carry on with that for longer. I'm trying to now get the picture to, to come forward a bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do some more layering of that blue. I'm going to create a V coming down, lower down. It's still wet, so I haven't bothered wetting the board before I put on this quite thin blue. So I need some more horizons. It needs to be a little bit more detailed. It needs to be more to look at. <laughs> So by bringing the blue through, you're, bringing, you're changing, you're adding another horizon in, but you're also creating a gap which comes forward as well. This way you can actually create paths through your landscape by actually just bringing in the sides, creating <coughs> a gap. The more I use this turquoise, the more I like it. I'm such a sucker for this. <coughs> You can put some more salt on top, and then what's going to happen is whatever colours underneath is going to show through. So I had green under this blue, so where yes, where the salt is going to eat through, it should leave the green of the previous layer behind. So it's sort of the reverse of what we were doing with the original salt, putting a layer on top. So getting towards the end, I haven't um, resolved the painting. Yeah. To be honest, I wouldn't finish a painting without sleeping on it. And certainly without getting in front of it to have it really done. But it's all about that, trying to push and pull the focal point, making sure that it's still bright but isn't too garish. Um, maybe you need some more detail. I certainly feel that I would like to put in some more foliage, maybe some, some sort of grass or something. And then, I'm sure you've had people talk about review, systems of reviewing paintings in the past, but um, for me, there's nothing like a break, <laughs> completely, and I tend to have two paintings going at the same time to help that, because even just painting something different is refreshing, and it gives you that boost that you need when you're getting tired. Um, standing way, way, way back from it, knocking it back so that you don't really see the colour as much you've seen by um, squinting. So you're just reducing the amount of colour information and you're seeing it more as a design than um, the actual colour. That's I find that the most useful of all actually, just squinting at it. It just, you can see, you can work out the positions of everything much better without the colour shouting at you. Um, and then um, people were talking about turning things upside down. I don't tend to do that, or seeing things in mirrors, I don't do that either. I'm quite happy just to have a break and then come back to it. But, um